science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. As July is winding down and we're heading into August, our family is going to be taking some much needed breaks from all of the projects we're working on. Chris and I have been working around the clock <laughs> on text from Bunsen. We just finished all of the sorting all the pictures for the 2023 calendar. We're creating this Paw Pack Plus community. Um, so you'll hear a little bit more about that in a month or so. Our patrons, aka the Paw Pack, some of them are getting a sneak peek at this community. It's really exciting. Exciting. And as well, we're still working on some really fun stuff like merch and Bunsen 2.0. And, and then later in August, Chris and I have to record the audiobook for text from Bunsen. So it's been busy, but super rewarding. And we're looking forward to taking some time off and exploring the mountains. Okay, what's happening on the Science Podcast this week? In Science News, we're going to take a look at an unlikely pollinator that you may not be thinking about that does actually more than science previously thought. In pet science, let's look at a study that checked out if dogs are confused when they move countries that have different languages. I never thought of that. You'll notice that the runtime of this episode is a bit longer than normal, and that's how it goes sometimes. Our guest, Dr. Gonti, who's an immunologist, I I couldn't stop listening to her. She is so cool. You have to listen to the interview. Hey, dogs, did you hear that the World Health Organization made an announcement that it's almost impossible for dogs to get COVID-19? So any dog that was in quarantine is now released. To be clear, who let the dogs out? <laughs> oh, man. Okay, on with the show. There's no time like science time. This week in science news, let's talk about a pollinating creature that isn't one that you normally think about. No, not the bee. Now, don't get me wrong. Bees are super important. If you've been listening to the Science Podcast, we've had Dr. Sandra Rian on the show. And man, does that scientist know everything about bees Yes, very important. What we're going to be talking about today comes from Biology Letters in July, and it outlines an unlikely insect that pollinates red clover. And it's not pollinators during the day. They looked at pollinators during the night. And guess what? There's not a lot of bees buzzing around during the nighttime. Bees, I guess, go to sleep. They head back. Um, at, they head back to look over the colony. A lot of bees are solitary. They're single moms, as Doctor Rehan said. So they're not out buzzing around at night. But you know which insects are buzzing around at night? Moths. Jamie Allison is a pollinator ecologist at Arathis University in Denmark. And this is where the information comes from. Now, Allison and her colleagues weren't setting out to discover this. They were looking at pollination by insects as plants moved around due to climate change. There's the idea that plants will move uphill as it gets drier in certain areas. So they were tracking pollination visitation to these plants. And they set up cameras to take pictures of, you know, what, what insects were landing on those plants and what times. Um, and this was all occurring in the Swiss Alps. So from June to August, they monitored 36 flowers of red clover. You might be wondering why is red clover being studied? Uh, you know, there could be many other plants they could be looking at. I get that. Red clover in that area of the world is important as a life livestock feed. So for cattle and sheep and, and the like. Now they took camera photos during the day and they took camera photos during the night. And it was the night photos that are the most interesting. Most of the nectar seekers, most of the pollinators were bees. So we have to give credit where credit is due to the bees. 61% were bumblebees. But the remaining percentage were filled in by other pollinators. 34%, so roughly a third, were moths. And mostly these type of moths called yellow underwings. 
to be fair, moths are known as pollinators. They're important, but it wasn't really well known that they did anything with clover. And it's just because we're not looking for them at night. <laughs> we're sleeping at night as scientists. So this camera technology is something that could be critical to study nocturnal movement of pollinators and other animals around the clock. Roughly a third of the pollination of red clover being owed, its, being owed to these moths is nothing to sneeze about. That's a huge amount of pollination that would not be able to be picked up by the bumblebee. So an unlikely hero of pollination is the moth. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, we're going to talk about dogs and language. This is really pertinent because literally this week we had Dr. Molly Carjun on our live show. Um, you'll find her recording on the RSS feed, the science podcast feed is science chat sometime in the future. But part of her research early on in her career was looking at infant speech and comparing it to dogs <laughs> understanding human speech too, like the understanding of when speech. When humans speak, when adults speak, do what do babies do? What do dogs do? And um, she found that there was some really good, really good fun data when you switched the language, whereas the babies lost interest when there was a new language and whereas the dogs were more curious. And I thought that was adorable. Now, this study isn't necessarily about switching the language within the home. This is this is a study that looks at when dogs move countries and now there's a new language, what happens? Now, this study comes from the Journal of Neuroimage by lead author Laura Kuei, who is a neurobiologist in Hungary. Laura and her family lived in Mexico with her dog, Kun Kun, <laughs> and moved to Budapest. So th that was her impetus to start looking at language. So what they did is they looked at 18 dogs, including Kun Kun, that's awesome to have your dog be part of the study, in an MRI machine, and they scanned their brains. The researchers played Spanish recordings to the dogs from a children's book called The Little Prince. Then a Hungarian person would read the book in the recording, and uh, obviously the two languages are very, very different, and they looked at how the brain scans in the MRI differed. The brain scans were super conclusive. The dogs were able to clearly distinguish two different languages were being spoken to them, a familiar and unfamiliar language. This is called hierarchy processing, something that humans do. The auditory cortex detects whether a sound is speech or not, then the secondary auditory cortex differentiates between is that something that you know or is that something that you don't know? An interesting thing is that the younger dogs didn't do as well as the older dogs, given that probably the older dogs just have more life experience with unfamiliar sounds. Now, obviously, dogs are probably not the only animal that can do this with human speech, but they're kind of the only animal that we can train to sit, that live, you know, live with humans and have a life experience with us and can be trained to lie pretty much motionless during an MRI. Animal behaviorists and animal researchers are always trying to look at how the brains of animals interact with humans and speech. So probably more of that information is coming down the pipe or on the table for study. So from this study, we can conclude that if I was to speak to Bunsen in English and then get Chris to speak to him in French, he would be able to understand that that's a different language. That's pet science for this week. Hello, everybody. The Science Podcast will always be free to download and listen to. You'll never have to worry about paying for it. But we have some amazing ways that you can help us out with running the show. The first one is to think about becoming a patron on Patreon. And we call our patrons now the Paw Pack. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of awesome perks and different tiers of support. We also have a very detailed and excellent merch store. And if you're listening to this in time... We have pre-orders of the Bunsen 2.0 stuffy that was just adorable. Um, you can check it out. There's also the Beaker stuffy on our store and a whole bunch of comfy clothes. The third thing you can do is give us a good rating. Rate the podcast wherever you're listening to this. We'd love to get a great rating from you. Okay, back to the show. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast, and I have Dr. Kate Kiganti, influenza vi virologist, with me today. How are you doing, Dr.? Hello, hello. I'm so excited to be here. I'm uh, excited to talk to you too. Yay. This is, I've been looking forward to this for a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, where are you calling into the podcast from? 
Um, I'm calling from uh, Georgia in the United States. Okay. Yes, now, are you there for work? Or are you there for study? Have you lived there for a while? So I've lived in I've lived in Georgia for about six years now. Okay. And uh, I work here. Uh, I am a scientist, and I've been working here for the last six years. Yeah. Now, are you from the United States originally? Did you move to the United States? Are Are you kind of one of those globe trotting scientists who have moved yes, all over the place? I am very much a globe trotting scientist. <laughs> um, yes, I, I am. I am very um, sort of proud of that fact. Um, I'm originally from India. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up there. Uh, I did most of my study there, um, but I moved to Italy for my PhD. Wow! Yeah, which was very exciting. Now, um, what, I, in, I introduced you as Doctor, like Doctor Gonti, and you have you're an influenza uh, scientist. What is that? What your PhD is in? So, my it's very interesting, actually. So, I am a virologist by training. Okay. And so, my master's degree was in virology, um, and I focused on dengue viruses during my master's. Oh. And. For my PhD, it was also in virology, but I my PhD was focused on HPV or human papilloma viruses. Mm. And then I moved to D.C., Washington, D.C., for mm. uh, my first postdoc uh, working with influenza. And then I moved to Atlanta uh, to continue working with uh, influenza and in the past two years, I've also done work on coronaviruses. Okay. So let's wind up, just back up just a little bit. Yeah. Um, what, what got you into science to pursue this path of studying viruses? Um, I've always been very curious. I like to learn new things. Um, and my first biology course when I was in high school um, I had I think I would credit a lot of my interest in science in particular but biology specifically to my one of my teachers uh, which is why I think educators play such a big role Um, she's the one who actually introduced me to uh, just how cool science can be um, I have uh, I have always been, and I still am very proudly a nerd. I am. <laughs> Go nerds. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I'd high uh, five you, but this is like we're talking to each other from different continents so, or different yes. countries. Uh, but yes, um, uh, absolutely. I was always a nerd. and But she is the one who sort of made me realize that science is cool and this is a uh, great and that sort of fostered my love for everything science related um and that was that's what got interested me interested in biology particularly mm, okay. and as i sort of went through high school and college i realized this, i realized that viruses are just about the coolest thing there can be i know there will be many other scientists who study other things who will di- might disagree because everyone's <laughs> what they study i think i talked to a few that might uh, like the squid scientist, Dr. Sarah McAnulty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, they, everybody thinks what they study is cool and <laughs> I do not disagree. But um, I just got interested in viruses because they are fascinating things. I don't even think you can call them creatures because they're not technically alive. But uh, the fact that they are not alive and then suddenly become alive. Just, I mean, to say that it's 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 amazing, and it's like something out of like an alien movie. It's 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 cool, and it just- is because they like if you've watched the alien movies with um Sergoni Sergoni Weaver, mm-hmm. they straight up they go into you and they burst out, and then that's how a lot of viruses do with yeah. cells. <laughs> yeah, and it is it's absolutely amazing, and the things they can do, they're so like. I, I can't even say they're microscopic because they're not they're, they, you can't see them and they just they do such fantastic things and you learn so much like most of the information we have about biological processes have come because of study on viruses and it's because people have been studying how viruses hijack cellular processes oh. and that's how we actually find out what 
the things in our body do. And so um, there's a quote, I forget actually who said this, but they, there's a quote that says that viruses are the best cell biologist. <laughs> I guess so. They have to know how everything works. Yeah. And they, and they truly are because they, it's by studying them that we figure out um, how pathways work in our body. It's, it's yeah. incredible. It, I I agree. Like I teach high school science, so mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm not at the level, of course, you are at. But when I'm talking to kids about viruses and just how weird they are, yeah. it's I think it's tough for some kids to wrap their head around that mm-hmm. they're like these tiny. They're basically molecules with yeah. sort of a mind of their own. They're not yeah. even yeah. <laughs> they and and yeah, they're quite weird. Now I just have a couple follow up questions from your masters and PhD. You studied two different viruses, the one mm-hmm. dengue fever and HPV. Could you, um, just for people, you know, since you did study those, would you mind just giving us a little bit of detail about those two viruses before we move on? Sure. Um, so dengue fever. Dengue, I'm sorry. <laughs> dengue. Yeah, no, it's fine. Like everybody in, in like South Asia calls it dengue. So Oh, okay. I didn't get it wrong. <laughs> Uh, you, I, I mean, it's. I've gotten into the habit of calling it dengue because everybody in Europe and like North America calls it dengue. <laughs> like okay, like, silly, silly like, us. <laughs> yes. Um. No, but it's. Uh, I both are not. I mean, both are correct. It's fine. Okay. You can call them correct. Yeah. <laughs> but it it is so dengue is caused by a. It's an RNA virus. So it is a virus that has RNA for its genome, and um. So it is quite, uh, so dengue fever is endemic to South Asia, Southeast Asia, and it is carried by mosquitoes. So mosquitoes are the vehicle by which this virus moves from person to person. Um, And people who get dengue fever have a a fever, like a very high fever. And uh, one of the characteristics of this disease uh, is... Um, very severe joint pain. It's oh. why it's also called breakbone fever because it feels oh. like the bones are breaking. Wow. Painful yeah. and awful. Very awful. And so dengue fever can have like different forms. So the mildest version is what we call as dengue fever, but there are more severe versions where you can have hemorrhagic fever. So dengue virus oh. is one of those viruses that can cause hemorrhagic fever. It means uh, you your organs start to sort of fail and you have blood, uh, mm-hmm. like you, you have hemorrhage, uh, similar to what happens when you have Ebola. Um, and the ultimate final sort of most severe thing that does cause death is called dengue shock syndrome. So it's basically multi-system organ failure uh, due to this infection that basically causes everything in your body to shut down and it can it is lethal that is awful um are there vaccines for this i seem to so there has been a lot of work going on to like to make dengue vaccines currently as far as i'm aware there isn't one that's highly successful Mm. and this is because it's a very sort of strange property of this virus so dengue uh, virus has four subtypes so it's basically four viruses that share some commonality, but they are um, different enough that infection with one will not protect against infection. Oh, that's annoying. Yeah. So, but there is some cross-reactivity. Now, the the awful part about this is because they share some similarity, there is a a phenomenon that happens. It's called antibody-dependent enhancement. So it basically means, suppose you got infected with dengue type 1 uh, and you recovered, your body has now had an immune response against this virus. So now you have antibodies against dengue 1. Now, if you get infected with any of the other ones, 2, 3, or 4, what happens is the antibodies against dengue 1 are not able to completely neutralize the other subtypes, but instead what they will do is they will help this virus get into the cells faster. They because they infect uh, macrophages, which are immune cells. Mm-hmm. They will they will uh, internalize this virus faster, and this causes much more severe disease. So, people who have secondary infections with other dengue serotypes can get 
it's not 100%, but can get much more severe disease the second time mm. around. So it's very difficult to make a vaccine for all four serotypes, which I mean, against all four types that have an equal measure of uh, uh, immune response. So it, it's why it's been very challenging to produce a dengue vaccine. Fascinating, but terrifying. I guess yes. wear your mosquito repellent in long clothes. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> like it's why control, like mosquito control is very important. Uh, it's um, it's really important to keep a sanitary environment, especially mm. in the summer when you do have mosquito breeding and don't have um, pools of water, stagnant water accumulating in, in and around your house. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Now, just for time, I think we'll move on. I'll edit out the HPV thing. Um, yeah. uh, not that I don't want to talk to you about that, but uh, oh, anytime. I, <laughs> I love your description. Um, thank you. I believe you're at Emory University now. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Now, what do you what do you do there? What's uh, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> A lot is going on. A lot, I figured. <laughs> yeah, as you can imagine, the past two years we've been very busy. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Um. So. I work, I'm a a research scientist um, at Emory University, and uh, I work uh, in, in my, our primary, our lab primarily focuses on influenza. Um, But the last two years, we've also been doing a lot of coronavirus work, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, So... My work focuses on the lab as as a whole. We focus on um, influenza reassortment. Uh, so, if you like, I can give you sort of like a preview on what reassortment is. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the influenza virus um, is, as you know, is very common. Uh, you get a flu season every year, mm-hmm. and there is a reason why. Uh, uh, and I'll just PSA, uh, ev- please go get your flu shots when they become available. It is uh, very crucial that you do. Um, and um, there's a reason why you have to get a flu shot every year. Um, and it's not just like, you know, a measles vaccine or one of the vaccines you get in your when in your childhood where just one and done and that's enough and you don't need to do it again. Um, there's a reason for that. It's because uh, the flu virus is... Uh, it's it's a virus that um, has a lot of what we scientists term as uh, antigenic uh, drift. It means that the virus uh, accumulates mutations every year because of the, it's a feature of the virus itself. It's, um, so the virus has enzymes that help it replicate its genome. Mm-hmm. Now, these enzymes lack something what we call proofreading ability. It means that if it makes a mistake, it cannot go back and correct it. So well, now what happens is... I think that's how I did every essay I ever wrote. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, too late. I'm handing yeah, it in. It's done. It's over. So yeah, yeah be- some viruses do. So a lot. Uh, some viruses do have this proofreading ability. An example is the current SARS-CoV-2 virus it does have this proofreading ability it wa- it's why it doesn't mutate as much as the influenza virus does okay um so what happens is once you have this if it's in if it's incorporated errors when it's replicating its genome some of these errors are fatal and it cannot go on but sometimes some of the errors it makes are actually beneficial uh for the virus so these can then continue on in its subsequent progeny. So now, if it's made some errors that are actually good for the virus, these uh, are what we call, um, it enhances its fitness. So therefore, these viruses now take over the existing population because they are better than what was previously there. And this is why you have newer viruses that are not so different from the existing ones, but they're different enough that we need to alter the vaccine composition every year. So we'll have, we have to basically, it's a year round surveillance program. Uh, the WHO conducts uh, influenza surveillance in the Northern hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere. And depending on what is circulating, we then, they give recommendations as to what should be uh, in the next year's vaccine. So 
it's that's how influenza vaccines are made every year. And it's why you need to go get a flu shot every year because they do change enough uh, every year that you you do need to update your, uh, basically you need to update your immune system and be like, oh. hey, I know you got this last year and that's fine, but there's a slight change. So we're just re-upping this right now. Yeah, it sounds like the Apple iOS with Twitter. Like you don't update your, you don't update your app and like six months later, you're like, oh man, what's going on? Nothing works anymore. Yeah, that's exactly how it is. You know, that's annoying that these viruses through the process of being clumsy, it makes them better. Yeah. I wish, I wish every time I tripped, occasionally I got stronger, you know? Yeah, you, you think so. I'd be in the NBA or something. Uh, that's why it's so fascinating. And, but it's also why, like, but this, you have to understand this is a, it's a numbers game. It's not that every time this happens, it's going to be like fantastic. <laughs> Most of the time it's failed. So, yeah. but the thing is they replicate so quickly and they just have so much uh, potential that uh, the more chances you give, it to replicate the more opportunities it's going to have to become fitter which is why vaccination is so important because that's the only way you are going to limit what we call community spread so the less number of what's important to remember is viruses cannot replicate outside of their host so in this case if you have a human host as in the case of influenza uh, and as in the case of the current pandemic i always bring it back to this because it's really important and it is important to know that the va- the virus cannot replicate uh, without its host. So if the hosts are all vaccinated and have are immunized, the virus has, the virus has no place to go. And if it has no place to go, it's going to die out mm. because there's nowhere for it to replicate. the The less number of people that are vaccinated, the more chances the virus has to stumble across one of these mutations that makes it better. Figuring Out Family isn't your ordinary podcast. It's a completely new experience that helps you make your family the best it can be by giving you the deep insights to help your family thrive. You'll learn how to help your family have more productive conversations and manage life's disappointments too. You'll feel inspired by the special guests that are experts in their field of family relationships. Get valuable tips for dealing with difficult family members repair broken relationships, improving your parenting skills and keeping your children happy and healthy. Check it out now. And we, I believe we saw this with coronavirus, right? We had the original coronavirus. um, Then we had all of these different variants as it spread throughout different communities around the world. Yeah. And so, which is why, a thing I'm very passionate about is vaccine equity. It, it's basically mm. that you can't just vaccinate a small group of people and be like, okay, we are done now. Everybody has to be vaccinated. Mm-hmm. And that's the only way to mitigate spread and, and mitigate this, this virus. Because eventually there's going to be someone in whom this virus replicates and that someone might come to a, to a place where everybody else has been vaccinated. But this virus has now mutated so that it's not a it's none of the vaccines are effective anymore so you have to go back to square one and start over Mm -hmm. which is not a conducive thing so vaccine equity is extremely important and it's extremely important that everybody gets vaccinated yeah it's a big difference with what happened with coronavirus versus like say smallpox because wasn't smallpox was the entire world absolutely yes and it's why it's essential that uh, we combat misinformation yes. and teach people why vaccines are important. Yes. I betcha. And I think we'll talk about that later too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So back, I sort of weird off track a little bit, but yeah. Oh, not- this is a great, this is a great off-road conversation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, um, I mean, about restocking. So as I was saying about influenza viruses and why you need a flu vaccine every year, uh, there's also a second phenomenon called, um, so we talked about antigenic um drift which is these accumulation of mutations that changes it ever so slightly which is why you need to have new vaccines every year um but there's also a phenomenon called antigenic shift so this is because um the influenza virus genome is super cool 
Uh, it is also an RNA virus. But instead of just having one RNA molecule as its genome, it has eight. Wow. So the, the genome of the flu virus is divided into eight segments. So each segment codes for a different protein that is responsible for uh, the virus replicating and uh, the virus completing its life cycle, which is extremely cool. Is that not super complicated? Like, Yes, it's what <laughs> makes it an incredible virus to study because the pro- the the property and and because it has this what we term as a segmented genome uh there are other viruses in the world that have this uh but uh it it does become it's it is complicated but it's also fascinating that the virus has uh evolved over these so many like i want to say thousands of years um to get to this point where it has such a elegant life cycle where it can actually get eight segments and eight unique segments at that into a virus particle every single time. It, it's fascinating to learn. And we don't know how it does it yet. We don't know exactly how. And that's a huge part of a uh, thing that people look at and are, are working on to understand how the flu virus packages eight distinct segments every time. Wow. Yeah. It, it's super cool. Um, but the, the property, and, and we're talking about reassortment, um, because it has eight segments, now you can imagine you have, let's say, a virus A with eight segments and a virus B, with which is a different vi- influenza virus, with its own eight segments. So now you have two viruses that are different enough from each other. Now, what happens when they both infect the same cell? <laughs> which uh, it does happen. Kind of party? I don't know. Yeah, it is a party because now what happens is you have 16 unique segments. Now you can imagine there can be any number of miss and ma- well, not any number. There's potentially 256 possible combinations <laughs> that can happen from these two viruses that have co-infected the cell. Now you have progeny that come out of this co-infected cell that is different from what has from the parents. So they're, they are now what we term as reassortants because now they have taken pieces from two different viruses and created a new virus. Oh my goodness. It's like throwing a bunch of stuff in a shaker cup and then dumping it out again. Absolutely. So now you can imagine like if you have red sprinkles and blue sprinkles, <laughs> mix them all together. And now you just have a party. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It's fascinating, uh, challenging to deal with, though. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's why, we, that's why you can't beat this bug with our current understanding, right? It just, yeah, so it just it's why evades we us with its weirdness. Absolutely. Like, it's why it makes it so fascinating. This is what the lab studies currently. We study how reassortment happens, like what are the factors that are involved, um, how is reassortment modulated. And because flu is very interesting because you find influenza viruses in, in birds, you find influenza viruses in horses, you find influenza viruses in dogs, you find them in water animals like seals. Um Influenza viruses are everywhere. Now, the reservoir from where all influenza viruses come is waterfowl. So gulls, uh, geese, these are major carriers of all types of influenza viruses. And it would have to be Canada geese. Of They're course. awful. Of course. They are They are, They are. are awful. Um, <laughs> yes. yes, they are. They are. But Canada geese uh, are, are a major carrier. So ducks, mallards, uh, okay. yes. So... What happens is now you have like water with all these influenza viruses and these ducks and geese and these waterfowl get infected. And then they pass this on because through migratory flyways, when these birds migrate, they go to other places and they spread this virus to other birds. And these other birds then, as they are moving around from place to place, will infect domestic poultry. Now, domestic poultry, if you have pigs can also, pigs do get infected. So you have these viruses moving to pigs and then pigs and humans come in a con- into contact a lot. So you can have pig to human transfer of viruses. Um, 
so yeah, so the influenza virus transmission scale is quite big. Hmm. Um, and it's not always like, oh, if you have an infected bird, you will get infected. That's very rare. Um, like bird to human transmission of influenza viruses is quite rare. Uh, but that's because uh, there is a lot of adaptation that needs to happen for a bird influenza virus to infect a human. Um, and that can happen through reassortment, which is why reassortment is so important to study. Mm. Because imagine you have a bird influenza virus mixing with a, a human influenza virus, and now you have these, this reassortment process taking place, and the human virus has taken bits and pieces from the bird virus, and now it's become this completely new virus that is that the human population has never seen before. Right. And imagine this is now fit and this can now spread through the human population. So now nobody has any immunity to this new virus. And now you have basically an influenza pandemic. It is based, it's what happened in 2009. If you remember what we, what everybody calls the swine flu. Swine flu. Yeah. I was teaching at that time. Yep. Yep. So that what happened then was, and I know I'm saying this and this is very simplistic, but this takes a lot of time. Okay. It doesn't happen overnight. This is a very long process over many, many, many years. Um, but basically what happened is uh, a bird virus and a swine virus um, infected pigs and pigs got infected with another virus and a triple reassortant was born. Um, so it is the final virus that came out that became the 2009 H1N1 pa pandemic virus was the product of reassortment from three different viruses. Hmm. And we forget how deadly that pandemic was. Like mm -hmm. there was, I want to say millions of people worldwide died from that. Absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't as bad as the 1918 flu, mm. but it was bad. Yeah. It was definitely bad and many 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 people got infected yes um now just a little bit off topic uh we're still studying coronavirus obviously and mm -hmm. um maybe we'll never really know where it came from but uh i remember reading a study that there was something similar in how the virus jumped from different animals and then got mm -hmm. to humans yeah so a lot of viruses do that people seem to forget like it's because people don't realize because some diseases have been in our consciousness for so long that we don't sort of relate it back to how it started. So um, a lot of viruses have animal reservoirs. We call uh, these, uh, and these are zoonotic viruses, that's a term. Uh, it basically means viruses that have come into human populations from animal populations. They are termed zoonotic viruses. Um, Many viruses are like that. Influenza is a zoonotic virus. Um, dengue fever is a zoonotic virus. Uh, most viruses have animal reservoirs. Um, there are. I'm trying to think of a of a virus that is only human, and I can't honestly, from the top of my head, think of a virus that is just human. I think HIV is the closest you can get uh, because HIV does not infect like cannot transmit to animal, like you can't give uh, animals HIV. But, mm. um, and I think HIV evolved separately from simian viruses, but I'm not completely sure. And I, but yeah, I, I most viruses that we deal with uh, on a regular basis uh, do have their origins in animal reservoirs. Mm. Um, so it's not as unusual as people think. It's just become very highly publicized now. And they uh, it's sort of become a sort of uh, controversial point, but it's actually not that controversial. I think. <laughs> yeah. Just that we know it just sounds, it sounds new to people who've never yeah. heard it before. Yeah. Uh, but for folks that study virus, you're like, what? Uh, that's not new. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, I mean, a virus is coming from um, animals into humans. It's It just seems like a lot more common now. It's because of increased globalization. Uh, deforestation is a huge issue because 
as we encroach upon uh, forests and other territories that were cut off from human contact, you're going to come into contact with uh, animals and the diseases they carry much more frequently. So it's much more likely that you're going to get something that previously w- wouldn't have come into human contact because they were so separated mm. from human civilization. Also, global travel and just the ease by which people move around now. So diseases that have, would have been isolated because they you are cut off from travel or just moving around, now they can spread worldwide because people can travel so much more easily. So it's one of the sort of consequences of increased human encroachment onto uh, onto the animal population, I would think. So we have a couple standard questions on the podcast. Uh, it's a little bit of a right term from the serious but fascinating talk about viruses. And one of our standard questions is for our guests to share a pet story. Could you share a pet story from your life with us? Yes. Um, so <laughs> I have a um, – my dog's name is Ben. Okay. Uh, he is a um, – he's half Great Pyrenees, half St. Bernard. Oh, he's huge then. Yes, he is. he's a big, big boy. <laughs> um, he is uh, very similar to Bunsen, I think. Oh. And uh, with, he's a bear dog. <laughs> and um, he is very loving. He's very goofy. Um, he he's a lot of fun. Uh, he does do his best to ignore me most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's very stubborn, uh, uh, but uh, he 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 is he is um, something that has brought me so much joy over the last few years. Um, I rescued him uh, f- seven five years ago when I moved to Georgia. Uh, so he's a rescue boy. Uh, he was two years old when I rescued him. He's seven now. Um, and I think it's one of those stories where uh, I know people, I've never experienced a love at first sight as much as I experienced when I saw him for the first time. It's one of those things that was meant to be. Aww. So it is a, it is a story that I tell a lot of people because it's, it's, Funny, I moved to Atlanta from D.C. in December of 2016. And I moved here on a Thursday. And I was, I always knew I wanted a dog. And I knew I wanted a big dog. It's something I, I, I truly, truly wanted. So I went, I went to this rescue. I was like, oh, I'll just go have a look. You know, I'm just going to go check it out. <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't. And there was not anything in my mind that I'm going to go uh, get a dog. But I saw him and like, oh, we just got a new surrender today. Do you, would you like to see him? I said, sure. And I saw him and it's one of those things where I, I saw him and I'm like, I cannot leave you here. Oh. And I got him home that day. And I didn't have any furniture in my house, but Ben was in my house. Like, Well, he's as big as a couch. He is as big as a couch. Absolutely. <laughs> he is as big as a couch. I'm looking um, at pictures of him on your profile. He's so cute. Yes, he's adorable. <laughs> um, he is absolutely he is he's an adorable, adorable boy. Um he he's here right now just watching me. Um <laughs> he hates to get his picture taken, which is I think extremely funny. Um if you try to get a picture of him, more often than not, he'll turn away and just walk away. <laughs> Run away. Yeah. He does not like to have his picture taken. Um, I think, yeah, I think the thing is, um, I would love for people to rescue more because there's so many dogs mm. who need good homes. So if you are able to rescue a pet and take care of a pet, please do so. Um, it's, um, they bring they bring so much joy. I, I think it was the best decision I ever made to get Ben. Aw. Yeah. He is such a smiley guy. He is. He is. He's extreme. He's very mischievous. Um, (laughs) He he is. Like, he's mellowed down a little bit since he's gotten older. But he was very destructive. Oh, he was chewing stuff up. Oh, he once... I came home once to find that he he had chewed through the drywall. Oh, no. Yeah. He's also eaten my sofa. Um, and, uh, multiple pairs of shoes, uh, clothes, socks, um, the, the duvet pillows, pillows are still his favorite thing to eat. 
Um, so yes, very destructive boy. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Beaker. She still has a bit of a destructive uh, streak yeah. in her. I, yeah. left, I left some treats in the pocket of my favorite shorts and then she ate the pockets out. Of course she did. Yeah. So now I don't did. have pockets. I, I put my phone in my pocket and it slips right onto the floor. I'm like, oh my <laughs> goodness. Beaker. Anyway. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's it's a joy. It's a joy. I love it. Thanks for sharing your uh, your story about Ben. Yeah. The other question we have on the podcast for our guests is if they could share a super fact with us. Super fact is something that they know that when they tell people, it kind of like blows their mind a bit. Um, do you have a super fact you could share with us, Doc? Um, I think we could go back to uh, what I was. Uh, it's it's part of my study, and it is something um, we've been. I have been working on. It's a pet project. Uh, we have uh, shown recently that um, influenza viruses can cause new infections in without forming any new viral particles, which was super cool. Um, so how do they? How does that work? So basically, uh, what happens is, so you have an infection. So the virus infects a cell, yeah, and it it replicates and it makes new genomes. And instead of forming new virus particles, the genomes are transported through molecular highways called tunneling nanotubes. So these are tubular structures that form uh, between two cells. So these form in the body naturally, like these happen and they're used for communication purposes. So imagine like a fiber optic line. Um, so it's some something similar to that. So it's a connection that's formed between two cells. So now what happens is usually this would be used for communication and transfer of nutrients and stuff like that between two cells. But now what the virus does is it moves its own genome through these highways to this other cell, which now becomes infected. Oh my goodness. It's like they've broken through a private road or something. Yeah. So now what happens is it's not, it doesn't need to form new particles. Uh, and the advantage of that is uh, the immune system cannot see it oh my because goodness. no new particles are present. It's like a ninja infection. Absolutely. Now my, my cell microbiology is a bit on the weak side. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember, are, the, are there little things that pull stuff along these nanotubes called kinesins? Am I on the right track? You are is, on the right track. So okay, it's probably called something different, but I remember they're, they're these, these, these little walking guys that walk. Yes, the walking <laughs> guys. So the kinesins uh, are, uh, use microtubules. Oh, okay, uh, it's within a cell. Along. Um, and so these ones, so the nanotubes, the tunneling nanotubes are made of actin. Actin, okay. Yes. So these are actin based uh, nanotubes. And uh, we think we don't know for sure yet. Uh, we think that um, myosin is involved mm. in transporting um, these genomes across. So we, what we found was uh, we discovered uh, last year that the molecule that was responsible for um, basically taking the genomes across. So the genomes are the genomes sort of attach themselves to this molecule uh, called Rab11. Uh, and now this Rab11 is then transported across these um, uh, nanotubes to this other cell carrying this genome with it. <laughs> An unwitting passenger. Absolutely, yeah. Hmm. That is a super fact. That is fascinating. It is amazing. You know, when you when you look at how the microbiology of just like cells work, it's almost... It's almost like wizardry. It's almost like magic. Yes. It's so cool. It is super cool. It's not like magic because we can explain it and we're working on the things we don't understand, but it is magical. I, it I'll is magical clarify. because there's something new to learn every day. Yeah. I love that. Yes. What a super fact. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The last section of the podcast is a fun one. We get to chat a little bit with our guests about things that they are passionate about, hobbies, causes, um, some guests have talked about cooking. Now you have a passion and you wanted to talk about science education and combating misinformation. Um, mm -hmm. wh what, uh, what would you like to chat about there? If you're a midlife woman embracing your age and wanting to make these years your best years, 
tune in to the Asking for a Friend podcast. I'm your host, Michelle Folan. Join me where I get your questions answered by top experts in their fields, and I speak to women just like you in all matters of health, wellness, career, and family. Subscribe to Asking for a Friend wherever you get your podcast, and refer to the show notes for where to follow us on social media. Um, I think the last few years has made it like very abundantly clear that um, we need to educate people better. We need to do us as scientists, as educators, as people who are more aware of certain things need to do a better job of communicating it to the general public who might not be aware of certain things. And it's important because just simply from a public health perspective, I think it's very important that we do a better job of educating and outreach and communication. Um, I, I really do think that us scientists, especially, especially I think, uh, we get so laser focused on doing the research, which is great and I love it and it's one of the favorite things for me to do. But I think it's important that we also communicate it to the people in our lives who are not scientists in a way that they will understand um, so that they are aware of what is going on and then are not sort of swayed by wrong information, Mm -hmm. disinformation when things do happen. So um, I think that is important. And I think there needs to be a more cohesive, more structured way by which we, we interact with the general public. Because I think as as scientists, we don't, we don't do it. And we leave all the communication to, you know, certain people uh, who might not necessarily be the best conveyors of that information. Mm. Um, And if, and if they get something wrong, you burn so much goodwill with the public. Like if you, if you have to yeah. backtrack anything, even though that happens all the time in science, right? Absolutely. Science yeah. has an idea and they're like, well, this is what we think now. And then tomorrow yeah. it might change. Yeah. Um, that's the other that's- frustrating thing in science communication is you communicate what we know, but tomorrow yeah. it might change. And we're not lying to you. That's just how science works. Absolutely. It's because we are evolving with new information. We evolve with as new information comes to us, we have to change what we were doing because the new information might be contradictory to what we thought before, but that it is science requires you to have an open mind. You have to have an open mind and you have to be willing to absorb new information and change accordingly. And that I don't think the public realizes that no, because they only see the final product. They don't see what has gone into it before. Yes. They don't I agree a hundred percent. Yeah, so they don't see all the things that went wrong and all the times you had to change an experiment or start over or do something completely different to get to this final finished product. And I think it's important that we take them along this journey Mm -hmm. as things are happening so that they are aware that this is not, we are not, like, we're not wizards. Like, it's not magic. (laughs) It doesn't happen overnight. Like When Guardian Vaxiosa. Vaxiosa. Like, I wish, (laughs) I wish we could. But um, I, I, it's not. And I think it's important that we communicate that to the public, that we are human too. Mm-hmm. We are learning with you, uh, especially when something like a pandemic comes along. We are learning as you are learning. Like it's coming to us fresh too. We didn't know about this beforehand. So um, we are just in a better place to do something about it. Yep. That's the difference. I agree. That's it's a two part. Oh man, because our account, we communicate science in a very gentle and quote mm-hmm. unquote fluffy way. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing is that any time we ever post about vaccines, there's always many many angry comments from people mm-hmm. that don't follow us. Obviously, they would not follow a science dog account if they are not great lovers of science. Yeah. Um, but there, that's the disconnect. One, yeah. you're lying to us. Yeah. Two, you don't know what you're talking about. Here's this mm-hmm. other YouTube video that proves that you're wrong. Yeah. So that's the thing. People don't necessarily understand what good science is and they don't understand the scientific process. So, which is very important, which is why it's important to start early. Like, mm. we need to, I think 
what is what is missing from especially like school education these days and i think as an educator i think you would agree with me is that we don't teach it like critical thinking and like logical thinking is not taught the way it needs to be taught in in to young children to know how to approach an issue and approach a problem and then think about those possible logical solutions and then be accepting of the fact that you might be wrong mm-hmm. and then accept like and then be able to then change your course and be okay this didn't work out so what can we try next that that sort of logical processing and critical thinking is not taught in schools nowadays which is very frustrating because we are then having generations of kids and generations of people who are not trained to consume information in a critical way and who will just take things at face value because somebody told them to yeah that is the whole big debate in educate like i'm an educator i teach high school mm-hmm. it is the big debate with curriculum development yeah do you get kids to memorize facts or do uh, you yeah. get kids to think and it's a no brainer for me yeah. if you get kids to memorize that's a great skill and everybody needs to you know at some point in their life you have to learn skills to memorize stuff of course um but if that is the only skill you you know and you're like if i'm standing up at the top uh, top front of the classroom and i'm like hey bigfoot is real he bigfoot yeah. exists in alberta um bigfoot is seven seven foot six kids are gonna be like okay i'll memorize that for the test without wait a second i think what the teacher's saying is kind of crazy yeah <laughs> Yeah, and like just to sort of like double check things, but then some people take it to the other extreme. Is like I'm not going to, I'm not going to accept anything you say, and of course what you're saying is wrong because I read this other thing somewhere else. Like mm-hmm. it's also about knowing what, what is actually factual and what is somebody's opinion. Mm. Yeah, there's good science, there's bad yeah. science, and then there's uh, YouTube videos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because everybody became a virologist the last two years. And oh, I, was like, I can't imagine somebody in your shoes. You're just like, oh my goodness, what is yeah. happening? <laughs> yeah, and it's like, it's difficult to sort of say, oh, that's really, because how many people are you going to go and say, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong? Like, mm. You have to be very gentle point. about it too. Like, if Yeah, you- and you can't be awful about it because there is something called, like there is ignorance because you didn't know. And then there is like, when you are intentionally like it's one thing to not know something because Hmm. we all don't know something we are all here to learn something and we all should be open to learning something new Mm -hmm. but it's one thing to be willfully ignorant and one thing to just be ignorant there's a difference i feel Mm -hmm. um because it's one is one is i think so people make money like honestly yeah 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 it's one thing to be like, oh, I didn't know this and now I know. Or, and the other thing to be, oh, I don't want to know because it is contradictory to what I believe. I got to sell some supplements. Yeah, something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it's a difficult job, but it needs to be done. Mm-hmm. It needs to be done to, to educate people. And just I am, people. I'm right there with you, Doc. Yep. I've, I've talked to so many scientists on the podcast and this has come up a few times, like this critical thinking thing. Yeah. I'm not an expert in how to even teach critical thinking. Like we try. And I, I, I think that needs to be like, I don't know who's going to take it on, but some kind of like educational governing body Yeah, where you like an educator like me can go and say, here's a lesson plan about how you could teach it. Right. Yeah. Um, and I know there's an organization in Canada that's starting to do that. They're called Science mm-hmm. Up First. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's the big thing, right? Is is getting it in the hands of people that can enact the most change. And if we got to start young, it's got to be sent out to teachers. Yeah, it does have to be sent out to teachers and and good teachers because I cannot tell you, like I said before, like a good teacher will change your life mm-hmm. for the better. It real they really will. And all my success has been because I've had great teachers and great oh. mentors. Like I've had awful ones too. No, there's no doubt about it. But it, if I've done well, it's because I've had great teachers and great mentors. And there's nothing better than that. Hmm. And yeah, I education really- is the great leveling field, isn't it? Absolutely. 
absolutely like it will change your life hmm. it really will i'm getting all verklempt this is like something i'm so passionate about um yeah me i'm so too. glad yeah, we're mean, talking about this yeah it's it's one of those things that i i try my best uh, i teach grad school courses mm-hmm. i i mentor new students in the lab and it i hope to be at least you know a small percentage as good as my as my teachers were to me so that i can sort of be a mentor to them and like help if i can help even one person i'll be very very happy the pay it forward type thing yeah yeah absolutely i love it um doc this has been such a great conversation um so thank you so much for giving up your time to talk to us about viruses oh. your adorable dog ben and uh, such a powerful i didn't know where the end, i always don't know where the end conversation is going to go but this was a really good one so thank you oh i'm so glad i'm glad i was able to i mean sometimes it feels like you're preaching to the choir it's like oh yeah we both agree but sometimes it's important to be like oh you're not alone and you're not the only one who thinks this way and yeah do you have any accounts that people could follow on social media Oh, um, I have my Twitter, like just mine or like anything like, uh, do, do you have a, like, yeah, let's see. What's your Twitter account. Would you like people to follow you there? Sure. Um, okay. my Twitter is just my name at, uh, Kate Key Ganti. Okay. So, um, it's just my name. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Okay. Um, we'll put those in the show notes. Yeah. And I'm happy to answer questions. If you have science questions, virus questions, um, you want to talk about Harry Potter? You want to talk about <laughs> uh, fluffy big dogs? Uh, yes to all of that. <laughs> you might get some people with both of those questions. Yeah, like travel, music, cooking. I do all of those things. Man, this is like, this should have been a two-part interview, I think, Doc. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to do another one. Like we can talk about like food and <laughs> um, yeah, I, I love to cook. Yeah. So, oh, um, sweet. Take care of yourself, and uh, we'll we'll keep we'll keep our eyes out for anything you send our way. Yes. Okay, it's time for story time with me, Adam. If you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks, and we have a special guest this week. Her name is Annalise. Her name is Annalise. Annalise, if you don't know, is is my girlfriend. I will start. I'll tell my story. My story happened when we were paddle boarding in the mountain in the yeah in Canmore. Uh, so if you don't know, we go paddle boarding every once in a while, and we take the dogs with us if it's not searing hot. This time it wasn't that bad, so we took Munson and Beaker, and I took Beaker onto the paddle board. And usually she's she's good with going on the paddleboard, but this time she she didn't want to be on the paddleboard all that much. She was crying, she was crying, and then she got tippy. And some guy was like, "Oh, your dog loves being on the paddleboard, eh?" Because he's he was like kind of Canadian. So I was like, "Yep, she loves being on the paddleboard." And then at that exact moment, he was like passing by on his paddleboard. She tried to jump onto his paddleboard. And she jumped and then made us both go in the water. <laughs> and usually that's all right if it's not freezing cold mountain water. It's mountain lake water. Mountain lake water. Not cool beaker. Um, but yeah, that's my story. Some dude was like, oh, your dog loves being on the paddleboard. She's so cute. I'm like, yep. <laughs> and then got tipped in the water. So, <laughs> yep. That's my story. When um, you fall on a paddleboard, you really fall because you're standing up. Like you're, it's not like you fall out of a kayak that you're, you know, crouching down or something like you would do an ender. Uh, Dad, do you have a story? Yeah, I'll talk quickly um, about, (laughs) uh, we, of course, as Adam said, went to the mountains for a day. We're going back. It's a really nice escape. We're so close to the Rocky Mountains and there's so many wonderful places to take the dogs for hiking or for, you know, paddleboarding or kayaking. And we went on one of our favorite hikes. We've done this. We do it probably twice a year. It's Grotto Canyon, just outside of Canmore. It's a great hike. So if you're a tourist and you're thinking about doing a hike, Grotto Canyon is about two hours, two and a half hours. Fairly easy hike in. There's some sketchy stuff to get into Grotto Canyon over the super slippery rock. Um, But once you're in there, then you're walking through the canyon on scree or like rocks. So it's maybe a little hard on your feet. 
but I, I, opposed to some of the other hikes in the mountains, this one's pretty tame. Um, and uh, there was mountain river water the whole way, and the dogs could not get enough of walking through this water. Um, and they are chaotic walkers. Normally, Bunsen is great. He picks a path and he stays to it. But he was so excited by the mountain water, mountain river water coming or creek, or whatever. Um, it w- He almost knocked me on my butt like 7,000 times because he would change his direction. And because you're stepping on rocks through the creek, so you don't get your, you know, step into water that's over your ankle or up to your knee, you got to pick your path carefully. It was a challenge. And then we came across an Anukshuk. Somebody had built an Anukshuk, which is like a little person. Um, it has spiritual meaning to the indigenous people of Canada. I don't know if that's why they built it or they just built a little person out of rock. And Bunsen's like, hmm, what's that? And he knocked it over. And I told Chris, we need to leave. And she, I don't know if she realized what he did, but it was, uh, I felt very bad that Bunsen knocked over somebody's Anukshuk. That's my story. Well, Okay. Bunsen was standing by the Anukshuk and I thought, boy, this will be a really great photo opportunity. Um, And then Bunsen looked at the Anukshuk and then proceeded to knock off the head of the Anukshuk. And then by then I was recording and then more of the, he pushed uh, more of the Anukshuk into the water. But do not fear, Adam repaired the Anukshuk and we went on our way. And it wasn't even like an accident. He didn't like brush up on it. He like. No, he did it on purpose. Put, he pushed it over with his nose. He like pushed his face <laughs> into it with his nose and knocked off the rocks. This is so weird. He's not destructive at all, but he really destroyed that Anukshuk on purpose. Um. Now, when you say destroy, he knocked off okay. two of the rocks. Three. Okay. Okay. He, he knocked two. some of it off, but it was definitely on purpose. Okay. Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. My story, I guess my story can go with the theme of Canmore and paddle boarding in Canmore. And we had everything set up. I put out this, uh, I, I want to call it like a camping carpet that uh, Adam and Jason mock every time I bring it out because it's amazing. But they're like, why did you buy that? It's amazing. You lay it out. And it's like a carpet and you can put your um, pop-up tent on it. It's amazing. So I laid it out and we laid out all our stuff and there we were. And then the day started. Later on in the day, there was a person who, I don't know why, probably because they wanted to get into the shade because it was some kind of hot. It was 27 degrees. Um, this person decided to go lay underneath, uh, the tree yeah. <laughs> that was right beside us. And Beaker was having none of it. She's like, do you see? Woof, woof, woof. Do you see that person? Woof, woof, woof. They're going underneath the trees. Woof, woof, woof. What are they doing? She was, she turned into Zool. Um, at that person, she didn't like. Are you it. a god? Pretty That's much. Every time when she starts to make sounds like that. Yeah, so it was very strange that she would react to none of the dogs, um, but the person who was making, setting up camp underneath the tree. Yeah, so that's my story. Okay, so like I said at the beginning, we have a special guest. Apparently Ginger wants to be the special guest because she jumped up on the counter. Watch out, she'll eat your mini wheats. Yes, she eats the food. She (laughs) prowls for the food and eats it. Um, But we do have a special guest and we have Annalise and she has a story. Um, I remember, like, Bunsen drank a lot of water out of the hose and then all of a sudden threw up. (laughs) But then also, he started running at me and I got so scared. And so I was running and running and then he was chasing me because that's what he does. And then he got some some of his leftover vomit (laughs) upon my clothes. And (laughs) it was really funny. (laughs) <laughs> kind of and then i was like oh there's vomit all over me now <laughs> oh okay <laughs> but yeah that's my story <laughs> and baker was just kind of nonchalant like poking at the little dog pool and <laughs> just using it as a big water bowl as well i thought it was really funny <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so that's story time. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast. And I can't wait to see you guys next time. Hopefully we have Annalise as a special guest again um, at a later date. Uh, bye-bye. Wow, I loved the chat with Dr. Kate Kigandi today. Um, it's such a treat to talk to somebody so passionate about values that align with our values as a family and educators, um, critical thinking, but also blown away by her knowledge with immunology. It made this episode a little long. If you listen through, thank you. Okay, let's give a special shout out to our top tier patrons on Patreon, the Paw Pack. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Take it away, Chris. GBLB, Tracy Domingue, Anne, Julie Smith, Sharon Dotson, Andrew Lynn, Elizabeth Parmente, Peggy McKeel, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Jaguer, Chris Kelly, Leela Periello, Sam, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig. Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Jody Ogren, Mary Ryder, Shelby Leggett, Mary Coos, Marianne McNally, Elizabeth Bourgeois, Karen Beth St. George, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, Ben Rathert, and Bianca Hyde. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh, let's go. Let's go. Let's go.